Amen. We're going to continue with the teaching that we started. Jesus, the Word, heals the broken heart. Jesus, the Word, heals the broken heart. The weakest person alive is a person who cannot control their emotions. We are at our weakest when our emotions are out of control. Emotions on the inside that move you in a direction and when out of control they move you into places you don't want to be. Emotion. The soul realm is your mind, will and emotions. Your emotions are last because your mind, the words you think about, your will decides if you're going to accept those words and they then put you in motion. The words you meditate on, the words you think, what you listen to, positive or negative, will put you in motion. And if you allow your emotions according to circumstances around you or hurts from the past dominate you, you will let your emotions control you and as I read, you will not be in a place you want to be. Every single person has been hurt in some way by someone. Some hurts and we sort of decide to graded on a scale. It's like somebody saying, well, I'm a good person, I don't need Jesus. It's for all the bad people. And they don't realize that all of us fall short of the glory of God. All of us were subject to Satan. We were born in sin because we were born with the Adamic sin nature. We all need Jesus. But we haven't all gone through some, the same satanic stuff, so to speak. But everybody's been hurt, and it, let's read uh, Luke 4.18. Luke 4.18, the spirit of, this is Jesus speaking, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. You don't need to be poor anymore. Jesus became poor that you can be rich. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. There's a lot of oppression going on, and it's in the body of Christ as well. I'm sent to the body of Christ as a teacher, teacher slash pastor. My job definition is to feed my sheep. But as long as we walk around with a broken heart, we will not be able to function in the fullness of what God's called us to function in. And everything starts with words. Let's look at Acts 10, 34. Acts 10. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In a truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. And we can switch over to the New King James now. As of a truth, I know that God is no respecter of persons. The New King James says, no respecter of persons. God is not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Without faith, you couldn't get born again. You couldn't be saved. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God. And every man has the measure of faith. The faith that you have in you is God's faith. So the faith you have isn't weak. That's in you. Your mental thinking might be weak. God is not a respecter of persons. Sometimes we think if we've gone through a lot of rough stuff, it's too much for God to deal with. Yeah, well, he can deal with, you know, Carolyn, she didn't go through anything. 
Nobody knows Carolyn. Everybody has gone through things, hurts, problems. Everybody. We are not to measure whether my hurt is little compared to your hurt. Hurt is hurt. End of story. And whatever it is that's caused us to have a broken heart, those hurts will stop us from flowing in the anointing. The reason Satan comes against you and wants to remind you of those hurts, and I'm not saying they may not have happened, but he wants to steal the anointing because you have a broken heart. Now, what is a heart? Your heart, some people say it's your spirit. Well, it's impossible for a Christian to have a broken spirit. When you become a child of God, when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, when you take that little ship that's come along the sinking ship and jump into it and his name is Jesus, you are saved. It's your choice. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, immediately you get a new spirit that God says in Ezekiel, I'll take out of you the stony heart. He doesn't just fix your stony heart. He takes it out. That dead spirit, that spirit that was alive to Satan, has been taken out of you, and he has put in us a heart of flesh. That heart of flesh is filled with God. It's got God's spirit in it. It's got all the anointing in it. It's got all the power of God in it. And it is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Your spirit is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So what we need to do is not to have a broken heart. When you have a broken heart, your soul realm, your mind, will, and emotions has been separated from your spirit. And until you get your mind renewed and understanding who you are and walk in that forgiveness and moving forward, you will have a broken heart. But when you get rid of that stuff and realize who you are in Christ, your spirit will no longer be broken. You will have a complete heart. Jesus came to heal the broken heart. He doesn't want you walking in those hurts. You know, uh, there was this one time, and, and I just thought it was such a big thing. You know, I was betrayed and all the rest of it. And it came to me, you know, you need to be in the Word. Everybody, if you're not in the Word, the Holy Spirit doesn't have anything to lead you by. So anyway, I was going on thinking, you know, I'm betrayed. And immediately, just all the scriptures came. And I saw Jesus how he handled betrayal. And I thought, well, the way I was betrayed isn't nearly the way Jesus was. But you see, the Holy Spirit will bring to you what you need so that you won't walk around with a broken heart. Amen. It's essential to put those things away. So let's uh, look at Hebrews 4. I want us to see the power of the word of God. Nothing. You cannot get past your broken heart apart from the word of God. You can try and do it the world's way, but it won't work. It's a Band-Aid. And when the Band-Aid gets wet and you rip it off, the sore is still there, and you have to go more and more and continuously. For he who has entered into his rest, we are to enter into the rest of God, has himself also ceased from his works as God did. We are not working as far as ourselves trying to heal our broken heart. We take the word of God, seeing what Jesus did, his finished works, just simply go to our website. We have on there the finished works of Jesus to rest in the finished works of Jesus. What we do is we take what Jesus has done, we meditate on that, and we rest. I don't have to heal my broken heart. But I do have to labor. How do I labor? In the word. As I said, when I felt that betrayal, I wasn't left way out 
thinking. The word of God came to me. I labor in his word. And if you're not in the word, the Holy Spirit doesn't have anything to work with in your life. And if that happens, the best thing for you to do is contact somebody. You can phone the church. You can phone somebody on, somebody mature in the Lord. Phone them, contact them, and they can give you scriptures in the word. But don't go to somebody that's just religious and is going to give you a list of do's and don'ts. You don't need that. You need the word of God. Because whom the Son makes free is free indeed. And the word of God always will make you free when you believe it and apply it and speak it. Okay. Next verse. Hebrews 4. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. It's something we have to do. God's not going to put me in his rest. It's there. I have to be in the word, and I have to speak the word, and I have to kick back speaking the word, knowing what God has said. I am not the sick trying to get healed. I'm the healed, and Satan's trying to make me sick. And you might say, well, you look sick. I don't care. According to the word of God, I'm healed. I kick back in that rest and I speak that word. I put my eyes on it. Put your eyes on it. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. What was their disobedience? And you might say they wouldn't enter into the promised land. Exactly. That's when we won't enter into rest. And we think we have to work and do it on our own. Instead of resting and the finished works of Jesus and what he's already done for us. You see, God said, I have given you the promised land. Go in and take it. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Jesus. So the word of God. You can't. Heal a broken heart without the word of God. For the word of God is living. It's living because it's Jesus and the word are one and the word became flesh and the word dwelt among us. And we beheld him. The word of God is living. It's alive. It's full of power. It's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. It'll divide it. It'll show you. You see, the world talks about the conscious and the subconscious and all the rest of it. What's in your spirit, once you're born again, you don't change. Your spirit is sealed and nothing bad is in your spirit. This is so important because otherwise, if we think corruption gets in our spirit, we're done. We're done. So our spirit's perfect, but when our soul is renewed and we're no longer brokenhearted, what's in our spirit will be pulled out. We talked about the dimmer switch. The power's there. Make sure the dimmer switch is up. It's like a water faucet. The water's there. It's up to you how far you open it. Even to the piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So there it's talking about heart, but it's not talking about your spirit. It's the soul realm. So we mentioned last week that we have to exit and then enter. We have to exit our old way, the world's way of thinking. We have to be dependent on God, not the government or the world's way of doing things. We have to get rid of our old way of thinking that we've been trained in. We often, and I hear this, people want someone to pay a penalty in order for them to forgive and be free. Well, I want to remind you, Jesus has paid that penalty. You see, there's nothing any human being can do 
to heal your heart. Nothing. Somebody may have hurt you, whatever it was, go up to you and say, please forgive me, I didn't mean to do that. The hurt is there. The hurt is there. This is why it's so important to put a watch on our mouth that we don't speak words that hurt and condemn people. We have to be quick to listen and slow to speak. But we want somebody to pay. Look, you hurt me and I want you to pay for it. Now I'm either going to cut you out of my life or, or I'm going to make you do 150 push-ups, whatever it might be. You hurt me and I want you to pay. So you hurt is ultimately, but you won't say so you hurt. But ultimately that's it. You hurt me. I'm going to hurt you. You've got to hurt. You made a mistake and it bought, caused me problems. I want you to have a problem. Now the world, that's the world's way. We've got so much of this trying to buy people's healing and it doesn't work. You can't buy somebody's healing. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no healing apart from Jesus. Too often we allow our past to define us and what people have done to define us. And we make assumptions about people or situations. We have a teaching on the website. I encourage you to go there. Defined by the word alone. If anything's defined, defining you beside the word of God, get rid of it. Amen. Defined by the word alone. I don't care what somebody says. It doesn't matter what your father, your mother, or whosoever, your boss, who said what to you. That's not who you are. Amen. And we have to, that's part of our labor, entering into the rest, finding out what the Word of God says, who we are, and what we are, and allowing that to define us, and not some principle of the world, some way of the world. Self-help groups are a problem because the self-help groups all have the same problem. And that's the world's way of doing it, and you rehash your problem. And rehash the problem because they say talking it out will make you feel better. The only thing that talking it out does is allows you to vent and let everybody know that somebody wasn't nice to you. And then, well, I had this, which is worse. Yeah, but you don't realize. And next thing, what they're saying is probably worse than what it was. Talking about the past never works. And we're going to look at scriptures on all of this. Self-help groups don't work. The only self-help group that will work is, for instance, ladies' Bible study where we study the Word and if somebody has a problem, they tell us and we go and say, here's what the Word says about it, and we speak the Word over them. That's the only thing that works. That's the only type of self-help. But that's not self-help. That's God help. That's Word help. And if any of you ladies aren't going to ladies' Bible study, you should be. You should be. And if you say, well, I've got a bunch of kids at home. If you have a bunch of kids, you might have a husband at home, and then maybe that husband ought to do what that husband ought to do and look after your kids. I know somebody that had a bunch of babies, and their husband just almost pushed them out of the door. Go to ladies' Bible study, and they looked after the children. It's not impossible. Now, Dave didn't, didn't do well beyond an hour. Or max two hours with the children when they were young, but Brent will attest to that. But that's regardless. He wasn't trained the way you guys should be. He didn't have the word the way you are. And if you're not trained that way, find somebody. We'll put you in touch with a man that's been trained that way, that realizes the importance of it. Amen? Anyway. 
don't know why we're going there, but... <laughs> Maybe because it gives me an opportunity to brag on my sons. They just were so attentive, looking after their children. One time, this is a cute story, has nothing to do with anything particularly, but Brent was out with his children and wife for dinner. And so Brent went to go change the baby. And there was no family washroom, restroom. And he went in the men's and there was no change table to change his baby. So what did he do? He went to management. You see, he has the idea, if it's a problem, complaining about it's not going to work, I better go to somebody that can do something about it. I don't know if they ever put one in the men's washroom. They did, eh? There was one in the men's washroom. You see, it's that whole idea that people walk. We think we're in enlightened time. That enlightenment isn't pertaining to things like that. The what they call enlightenment is really in darkenment. Anyway, I always have to find a way to let you know how the word works with our children. Now, I'm not going to give Carolyn the microphone at the moment. She might have a different story about my son, so we, we'll pass by on that. Broken-hearted people. If you have a broken heart, you'll have broken relationships. You'll blame other people for your problems. Let's look at John 10.10. 10. We're going to start looking at some, some scripture. The thief. Who is the thief? Comes. Let's go New King James, okay? Let's switch it to New King James. Oh, it is. I apologize. I saw an N. Yeah, that's right. Never mind. We'll stay with this. We're good. Thanks guys. The thief comes not, but comes not except to the reason it was a problem. I'm reading that and I'm actually trying to quote old King James. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. His name is Satan. Steal, kill, destroy. If there is anything in your life that steals, kills, and destroys, it's the devil. It is not God. If you are thinking thoughts and they make you feel lousy, it's not God. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That's today in this world, not in the world to come. That life that he came to give us is God's life here in the earth where we do not have a broken heart. And the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I maintain that what he's out to steal is the word of God. Because Mark, in Mark chapter 4, it says the sower sows the word. And Satan comes immediately to what? Steal the word. So he's out to steal the word. If he can get the word out of you, He'll destroy and kill. And another example of that the word, he comes to steal the word, is he came to Eve saying, hath God said, and he wanted Eve to think God was a liar, that he wasn't faithful to his word, but he came against God's word. Religion comes against God's word. Religion is a killer. Religion will keep you in bondage. Religion will give you a bunch of do's and don'ts to please God. You can't please God without faith. End of story. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So Satan comes. So that's, a, I believe, a dividing line. We're under grace. And as I said, salvation has been made, made available to all men, but all men are not going to be saved if we don't accept it 
believe in our heart, confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, we will not be saved. I do not believe or put forth the idea that all men will be saved. There is the availability, but if we don't accept it, or as that little testimony of Brent's, if we don't get in the boat, we will sink, we'll go down. So we all, with that, knowing Satan is our enemy, he comes to steal the word, kill and destroy. Now you know why it's so vital to be in the word. We have something, the world calls it a philosophy or a theory. We have something that will define what we do, how we act. It's our attitude. Our attitude acts as a guiding principle for our behavior. What is your attitude toward church? What is your attitude toward praise and worship? What is your attitude toward giving? What is your attitude toward the word of God? It will define your behavior. When we know and understand why and the purpose of praise and worship, corporate praise and worship, personal praise and worship, it's something we will always do. When we understand the Word of God, our attitude toward the Word of God, is it casual? Oh, well, I put in my five, ten minutes. Or is it a time of fellowship with the Word which is with Jesus? You see, the Word and Jesus are one. And when you're fellowshipping with the Word, you are allowing the Word to be Lord of your life. We are easy to say Jesus is Lord, but do we realize that the Word is also Lord? Do we? If it is, we'll do what the Word says to do. Now, God's not going to strike you down dead. Lightning's not going to hit you if you don't do what the Word says. But if we don't do what the Word says, we've opened ourselves up to Satan and we've given him access into our life. That's just the way it is. We've done it. God doesn't give access to Satan. We have. That's why he's given us his Word to keep us. The way your attitude is developed because it's the lens through which you view the world. And you make decisions through that lens. It's a filter. How do you filter what you hear? If you don't know the word, you won't have the right filter. If you listen to a lot of cancel culture, woke, etc., you will begin to believe that, and there's all too many churches that have gone that way because you will have the wrong filter. You won't be filtering it through the Word of God. It's vitally important. It's vitally important. But again, it starts with our attitude. We know the dividing line, but in that dividing line, sometimes we like to make exceptions. Well, yeah, the word said that, but you know, that was for then. This is now. We're in this new enlightened society. God can't really mean that. Well, that's what makes him great, because he says what he means and means what he says Amen. all the time. It's your mindset. And we're going to look at fine scriptures on all of these points that I'm giving. It's a mindset. It is the way you think, and it controls the outcome of your life. So we, these are things we have to ask ourselves. What is my mind set on? What is the lens I view things through? We're, we're talking about a broken heart. What is the lens I view what happened to me in the past? How do I view that? 
Because you know what? What happened, happened, and it's not going to go away. But you can get it to a place where you're healed and the pain of it and the memory of it is fading. You can get to a place where it's not on your mind at all unless somebody might say, I remember, and then tell you what they remember about you. Amen. You see, we're washed with the water of the word. Your attitude will cause you to fail or to succeed in every area of life. And if there's an area in my life where I'm not succeeding, I have to check my attitude because I know the word deals with it and maybe I didn't get in the word or accept the word on it. Let's go to John 16:33. John 16, 33. These things I've spoken to you. Now Jesus is talking about he's going to be crucified. He's going to be um, killed, etc., etc. And he said, I've spoken these things unto you that in me you may have peace. There is no peace outside of Jesus and I know people have come to me and asked me to pray for them for peace they want peace and I say I can't do that I will give him perfect peace Isaiah 6 Isaiah 26 3 whose mind is stayed on me you're lacking peace check where your mind is In the world, you will have tribulation. That's a fact. There's tribulation. There's tribulation. Jesus said you're going to have it. But be of good cheer. He's saying, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to leave you. But be of good cheer. Because in me, you have peace. Well, we know once we're born again, in our spirit is all the fruit of the spirit. And Jesus is our peace. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus is speaking faith. He hadn't been resurrected yet. If you go through what Jesus always said, Jesus went to the cross, went into hell, and was resurrected by faith. Jesus said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the Father's going to raise him up on the third day. And he will not see his son forsaken. He will not see his bones broken. All of this was prophesied. He will not see decay. Jesus spoke the word and he released faith and I believe it was Jesus faith that brought him out I know it was the Holy Spirit was sent Holy Spirit went into him in hell and raised him up resurrection power that we have I understand that but Jesus spoke the end result Jesus spoke it The world has joy and happiness directly proportional to circumstances. If what's happened to you didn't work, or if your circumstances aren't nice, or if your wife or your husband or your kids are not doing or saying, if your siblings, you have a problem with a sibling, you are allowing yourself to be like a wave on the sea every time something comes, Satan can bring something against you, some thought, you lose your joy. And Jerry Savelle years ago had a book out, if Satan can't steal your joy, he can't steal your goods. Are your goods stolen? Where's your joy? Your joy, your happiness is not dependent on your circumstances, Amen. but on the person of Jesus Christ. And it's not on anybody around you. 
It's not dependent on your job, your boss, your husband, your wife, your friends, anybody. Your joy and happiness is dependent on the finished works of Jesus. Has to be. Otherwise, we'll be up and down like a yo-yo. Mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. Well, wasn't it prophesied John would go before him and then the, the valleys would be brought up and the hills brought down? The Christian life is to be a smooth road. Now, I'm not, when I say smooth, I mean it, we shouldn't be up and down, really full of joy and excited one minute and just dragging our feet, oh no, God's forsaken me the next minute. There are problems, obstacles, minefields on the road we're on. But there shouldn't be hills and valleys. Don't let the world convince you that your joy and happiness is dependent on the, what happens to you, on your circumstances. What's happening, and it's big also in the body of Christ, is depression. And it should not be. And the world's way of dealing with depression is to say, well, you're depressed because of the mess that you came out of or what everybody did to you. And they will medicate that person. And that person has no hope of walking normally in this life. Now, if you need medication until you get out of it, you've got to go and get to some place where you know if you change your way of thinking, honor God, change your way of thinking, you won't be depressed. Depression starts with thinking stinking thoughts. As a believer, this should never happen to us where we're depressed. And then I know they've said the reason you're depressed, and then they label it bipolar. I understand that, that according to the world system, according to medical science, that's a thing. I understand that. And if you need medication to get through that, but you have to get in the word and the word of God. By his stripes you're healed. And it doesn't matter if it's a mental problem, a brain problem, whatever problem it is will be healed. And the reason you're in that depression or whatever it is is because you've been thinking wrong. And when we're thinking wrong and thinking along those lines, it's really self-pity. Our joy is not dependent on things, but rather on the person of Jesus Christ. He is our peace. And the way we take advantage of that, and I'm going to talk about and give scriptures on how, but is to keep our minds stayed on things above. Now I know I've heard that statement, and maybe some of you have, oh, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Well, the people that might be that way, all they want to maybe do is talk about dying and going to heaven. We're not talking about that. Heavenly minded is being minded of the spirit. All problems in this life grow dim when compared to the glory of God that has become ours through Jesus. You have to remember, you have this treasure in earthen vessels. You have the glory, the power, the anointing of God in you. 
And it's up to you, it's up to me, to deal with my thought life, to renew my mind. And just because somebody says something, or ticks me off, or ignores me, gives me no right to get into a funk and behave unseemingly. Amen. Ever. Because if we allow that to happen, Satan is leading. I don't know if any of you have ever seen, been on a farm or have seen it, but they put a ring through a bull's nose. And you can get this most mean, vicious bull, and all you have to do is hook your finger in that ring, and you can lead it around. And when we allow what people say to us, cause us to behave unseemingly, cause us to get frustrated. It's like Satan putting his finger through a ring and leading us around. For believers, for spirit-filled Christians, we have to get past that. We have to renew our mind and walk in the word and not allow these flesh flashes to control us. And a flesh flash is thinking carnally. Thinking. According to my feelings. You hurt my feelings. Stop it. Well, you wouldn't understand. No, I don't, but Jesus does. And the word covers every single area all the time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God.